Surface design, your next career move. What does that mean? Um, first, I need, I need to answer this question, right? Does, does anybody not know what this is? Totoro, this is uh, My Neighbor Totoro by Hayao Miyazaki, the god of, of animated uh, Japanese film. Um, and this is one of his all-time most beloved uh, pieces. Totoro is this big kind of uh, forest demon, but they're not really demons. They're really, really friendly. And there's this little family that moves in, and they start to get to know these magical creatures that live in the forest. Um, and he's a big, gentle giant. This is a cat bus. It's, it's a bus that is a cat. It's called the cat bus. Um, and then you got little Totoro and, and then big uh, Totoro. So it makes sense. This talk makes a little more sense, the analogies, if you know the, 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 the stuff. But uh, it's OK that you don't. They're super cute. And, um, and now I've introduced you into something else that you need to go watch. Go watch My Neighbor Totoro. It is a fantastic film that the whole family can enjoy. So um, let's uh, take a peek under the house and uh, figure out what's going on inside this, uh, this stuff. So you're probably thinking, uh, that's OK that you like Totoro and anime. You're weird, but that, what does that have to do with anything? Um, service design. So here's, here's uh, some ideas about what it is. So useful, usable, desirable, efficient, effective services. Um, and a service is a service. A service is buying a car. Uh, it's, a service is going to the store. A service could be an API. Okay? One of the best companies at service design, in my opinion, is um, uh, that one company that does the, the APIs for credit card stuff. Um, not Stripe. Stripe, thank you. Uh, fantastic service design company um, based on the way that it's, it's also UX, but it's also a service. Um, lots of definitions for, for, and you're starting to get a sense of what some of the, the kind of jargon and, and buzzwords that you hear around, around service design are. So instead of just telling you words, 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 I'm so sick of words, right? I'm, I'm going to show you an example. Uh, and one of the first examples I had of, of an incredibly amazing service design experience. So here's Totoro, and uh, there's his friend introducing him to Nest. Does anybody not know of the company Nest? First, oh, okay. All right. Well, this will be fun for you, okay? Um, I'm just going to talk to you because everybody else knows. So, uh, no. So, Nest makes smart thermostats. So, a friend of mine told me about Nest, and I was like, well, okay, interesting, short name. I can't believe they got Nest.com. How often do you see a company with a short little URL? Um, but what is this thing? So, I Googled it. And, and this is an old screen cap, you know, old Google. Um, but uh, I Googled it, and lo and behold, you've got a, a result here. And it says, Nest.com reinvents unloved but important home products like the thermostat and the smoke alarm. We focus on simple, beautiful, and thoughtful hardware. Right? So that's the first thing I see when I search for Nest. And I, I just searched for the word Nest. It wasn't, I didn't search for Nest thermostat or anything. It was just Nest. And I got what I was looking for. Bonus. So then I, go to the, I click on the link, and I go to the site. And this is what I see. Wow, it turns itself down when I'm away. That's cool. Um, what else can it do? It keeps me comfortable. Ooh, I'm liking, I'm liking this simple design. I'm liking kind of the, the aesthetics of it. I would like that on my wall. Helps you save energy. Oh, because it's got that auto away. I just walked out. It detected I wasn't there. That's pretty cool. All right? And so I see the, the kind of the ad campaign that it's got. And these, this, is, this, this is their carousel. I, I would argue it's one of the few instances where I'm like, OK, a carousel. I like it. Uh, most times, I want to kill them with fire. So, um, so the next thing I do, I have a really old house. Will this work for me? They have a link that says basically that. And I click on it, and it says, take the face off your thermostat and look at the wires and look for these kind of things and click these check boxes um, when you see this particular wire. I'm like, OK. And so I do that. So I open my thermostat, and here's what it looks like. Um, OK, I've got four wires, and all right. So I click those four check boxes, and I say, yes, continue. And it immediately tells me I'm compatible. I don't have to worry about it. I already know. I don't have to search documents. I don't have to say, I have a blank. Is my thermostat or, or whatnot compatible with blank? No, it just does it. 
then there were, there were a couple of first gen and a second gen um, available at the time. So I was like, wow, that's really cool. So of course, I ordered it. Now, they're not cheap, okay? But for a thermostat, because you can go to Home Depot and get a thermostat like that one that turns heat up and down for like 10 bucks. And this was two or 300, I don't, I don't even remember. Um, but I'm no Luddite and I like bleeding edge technology. So I, I, I'm just gonna do it. So we get it and we unbox it. Oh my gosh, one of the best unboxing experiences I've ever had. The, like the, the, if we go back a slide, see this thing right here? It is the perfect width to contain that box. And when you turn it off, the box weighs just enough to just go right, and it, and it comes off. And it's just amazing tactile feeling. And I haven't even seen the thing yet. So then I unbox it, and everything I need is packed in the box in the order that I will need it. I mean, it doesn't sound mind-blowing, right? Well, duh. But how many things have you unboxed that are in, you know, human-proof packaging or, 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 or anything? Uh, it even comes with tools that you will probably need. You can do it without owning any, other, any extra tools other than the stuff they gave you. And it even has this, uh, oh, I'll get to that later. So the unboxing was fantastic. So I opened the directions. I'm so impressed, I'm like, I want to do this right. So I actually opened the instructions, unlike most guys, right? And in that, they have these little stickers with all the labels, because the second I disconnect my thermostat, I will no longer remember what those wires were, unless I took a picture, right? But you don't have to. You just grab these little stickers, and you stick them on the wire, and then you disconnect everything. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. So notice this right here. So I take the thing, and I put it on. It's got a built-in level, because it can only go on one way. So they built the level into the thing, so I didn't have to like guess, work. You just do it. And then, lo and behold, magic the, num the labeled wire goes, you stick it in the hole with the right label, and that's it. Uh, and then you should, huh? So was, the, was there a W on the other side? Yeah, that yeah they're, they're double-sided. Didn't, Didn't matter. And so, and I turned it on, bum, 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 ba -dum. right? I got a, a wiring report, Nest E sharp, sharp. <laughs> Nest has detected a problem with the, Blank wire. This is a screenshot of one of the, this isn't actually the one I got, but it's similar. For details, go to nest.com slash E sharp sharp. It actually says like E23 or E14. It, there's a code and they have, the URL is nest.com slash error code. And I was like, no way. And so I go there and, and immediately I go to the site and I say, hey, what, what's going on? And, and immediately uh, it says, oh, here's a video of your problem, and it shows a video. You, users often get this problem when their e-wire isn't properly seated. Remove your device and make sure that that wire is pre pressed in all the way. You'll know it's pressed in all the way because the little tab is completely depressed. So I watched the video, I open it up, sure enough, that's what it was, and ta-da, it worked, no other problems. So that was just, it, <laughs> it was mind blowing. So then uh, a month or so goes by, and I've been using it, and I get this in my inbox. Okay, so it's my April home report, um, and it say, says a little bit about what Netflix, or Netflix, Nest is doing and how many kilowatt hours of power is saved. I used 110 fewer hours last month, um, and maybe reasons why, maybe it was too hot, maybe it was really cold, and it just tells me, here's what you're doing right, here's how you compare to others, it gamifies it with leafs, um, uh, look at your leafs. Um, like, like this, I'm, oh, I'm better than 75% of the people in my area. Just everything about conservation and, and the learning, it's just, I was like, it's warm and fuzzy. It's just, it's lovely. Um, this is accomplished through the practice of service design. So one of the interesting things is the second time I did it, um, I, this isn't included here. When I moved here, um, we rented a house and, I, and they had this uh, old thermostat that was had a mercury switch in it. I'm like, yeah, this is not using this. So I pulled that off, put it in the cupboard, and I, I bought an S and put it on. Everything went well, except I got to a part in the startup process that didn't work. Well, it's 1030 at night, and I'm, I wanted, I disconnected the old one. I, don't, I didn't take a picture. I don't know how it goes back together. <laughs> and, and I was like, crap, what am I going to do? We won't have aircon tonight. And so I call support. It goes ring, 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 ring. Hi, thanks for calling Nest Tech Support. How can I help you? And I waited for the bot to continue. It wasn't a bot, it was a guy. And he was in California. I'm like, 
What? First of all, what are you doing? <laughs> How am I talking to a human right now? You know, I'm like, kumusta ka? Filipino ka ba? Takasan ka? Because I'm so used to the people I talk to in tech support being from Bacola, Philippines, where I used to live. And so I'm trying to talk to him, and he's like, no, man, I'm just an American. What, what do you need? <laughs> like, oh, sorry. Uh, so I said, well, here's my problem. He goes, oh, OK, this is going to sound dumb. Go back two screens, and then go forward one screen, back a screen, and forward two screens. He goes, it sounds stupid. It's like a Konami code. Just do it for me, please. And so I was like, OK, back, back, forward, back, back, forward, forward. Hey. I'm through. He's like, yeah, I'm really sorry about that. There's a bug in the latest version of the OS. It, now that you're through it, the system will auto-update itself, and you'll never see that problem again. Really apologize for any inconvenience it may have caused. And that, it's taken me longer to explain it than it did to actually do it. And I said, what are you doing? It's 10.30 at night. What? I mean, it's only like 8.30 where you are. He goes, well, uh, to be honest, Nest did a study. Right? Uh, they did a study, when do people install these things? And they found it's predominantly men, predominantly late in the evening after they've put the kids to bed. So their primary support window is between like uh, 6 p.m. and midnight that span all the coast, all the time zones. And because they know their users, they know when they're installing their devices, they built a support system around that. That is winning. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it, I can't speak highly about Nest. Uh, it's, I buy every product they have. Um, so from whence came this magical creature called service design that makes stuff like this possible? Okay. So this is a, little, a brief history in time. So in 82, um, it's the purview of the marketing department. Ooh, bad, right? Um, so uh, they introduced the service, design, the service blueprint to map the sequence of events in a service and its essential functions. So anybody done service blueprinting before? Cool, All right? So 82 is when that was uh, created. How many of you learned about that within the last couple of years? <laughs> right? It's been around forever. And yet, so service design, don't be surprised that it's, it's new to you. It's new to the United States, and you'll see why. So in 91, uh, Dr. Elhoff introduced this service design as a discipline at Köln. So they've been teaching this stuff at university in the UK, well, in, in Europe, since 91. Uh, in 2001, the first service design consultancy was formed. So there was enough need for it. Again, this is all in the UK, um, well, in, in Europe. So this one is in UK. It's in London. Then uh, the service design network is launched by Cologne. Um, and uh, they form academies and, uh, to, to create an international network. Of, and it's largely purview of academics and professionals um, who are really interested in how humans interact. With, with brands and products and whatnot. Sound like anybody we know, UX designers, right? But they're interested in more, more than just where does, where does the dropdown go? And by the way, don't make it a dropdown, right? So um, 2013, Adaptive Path launches the Service Experience Conference. Anybody ever been? You almost kind of? Well, they yeah. Came oh, they, they came here? Oh, yeah, they came to Cap One, yeah. So it's, I've, I've been able to go once. It's, it's pretty incredible um, getting all like, because all those people from 82 and 91, they're all there. And, and it's really cool to, to, to see them, uh, this, this thing that they've birthed. But it wasn't really until Adaptive Path brought service design to uh, the United States that anybody here even know what, know, knew what it is. I think in the United States, now that Adaptive Path is no more, as far as most companies are concerned, um, there are only a, couple, a handful of consultancies that do service design exclusively full-time in, in the nation. Uh, in Europe, every government agency has service designers, right? In the U.S., I think there's a couple in, in D.C. We're, just, we're brand new to this stuff. We are the Alan Coopers and Donald Normans and Jared Spools of service design in the United States, okay? So um, what does service design look like? So here are some, some buzzwords. Um, touch points. What's a touch point? Or a customer touch point. Yes, yes. Uh, a touch point. Actors. Who's an actor? You are. So this, this is why we don't use users in service design generally, because an actor can be anyone or anything acting upon. It could be a service. It could be a machine. It could be AI. It could be Siri, right? It's, it's who, is, who is the actor 
performing work or, or a handshake kind of a thing. Um, we've got customers, uh, service blueprints we talked about, experience maps. What's another name for an experience map? Journey map. And that's what we'll be doing a little bit later. Uh, there's a ton more. So what is a touch point? Uh, I like to think of a touch point as a brand shake. So just like you said, it's when the user interacts with that brand. Um, and it could, like if you think of the Nest example, when I Googled for them, they had, done, they had designed their SEO in such a way that it, it bubbled up properly where I wanted it, and it showed me the semantic markup was done properly, so it rendered properly in the Google, uh, in the Google results. So I got to know what I needed to know when I needed to know it. Right? That's a touch point. And along a journey, right, an experience, you're going to have multiple touch points with each brand. Um, actor, managers, marketers, engineers, designers, could be frontline staff, back, back end people, customers. Those are our traditional people, right? Users, clients, person, persona. Um, and it all depends uh, because you don't really have a user at Starbucks, right? They're a customer. So, uh, service blueprint. So, ideally, uh, employees contribute um, to the prototyping of di different things. And, and blueprints are kind of a standard method for helping you understand everything that's going on front front of stage and everything that's going on back of stage. And so we, here's where that actor kind of method, uh, uh, metaphor comes, in, comes into play, where you've got actors doing things and things that they're seeing happening on stage, you know, front stage, but then there's a whole bunch of supporting cast backstage. This could be um, back ends, these could be, again, APIs, they could be uh, emails and, and ad campaigns and TV commercials, right? That, that, people supporting all of that stuff, and then the, the customer only ever sees kind of that end result. So there's when, and, and, and you may think of it like when uh, I push a button, maybe I want to, so I wanted to buy a Nest, right? So I put, pushed buy somewhere. I think I was at nest.com, so I hit buy. So uh, uh, an e-commerce platform took, registered that. Eventually, I think probably a human had to see that, and then they had to go pick one off a shelf, put it in a box, kind of a thing, and then ship it. It's very likely, like Amazon-wise, that a robot did all that, but I don't know what their infrastructure looks like. But that's that backstage stuff. The second I hit go or buy, I, don't, I have no vi visualization into what, what's going on backstage. All I know is I did this, la, 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 and then it showed up in my mailbox. Magic. Experience map. Um, this is what we'll be doing a little bit later, uh, also called journey maps. So it's a visualization of uh, that user's experience throughout uh, a given set of touch points, or given a journey. Um, today we're gonna look at the journey of getting a cup of joe, or hot chocolate. So what else is there? There's a ton of stuff. These are just a few. Um, stakeholder maps, shadowing, the five whys, day in the life, uh, personae, um, storyboards, service staging. So uh, I think one of the, um, Frog is one of the companies that does a lot of service design. Um, and I saw them uh, talk about some stuff they did for CVS. Uh, CVS wanted to revolutionize how customers thought about the, the brand CVS. They wanted, to, to, they wanted, when you thought CVS, you thought, I need to fulfill my prescription. Um, that's what they, not, I need to buy cheap toys during spring, right? Or I need a, a row of candy. They wanted to be the place to go to fill your subscription, your subscri sorry, prescription. So uh, they hired Frog and Frog, got a warehouse, and they got a bunch of cardboard, and they built a CVS out of cardboard, right? And, and they had different modules. They prototyped. They wireframed, okay? And they, and they funneled people through. First, first, they did it with Lego, right? That's a very common use. Instead of using, like, Sketch and Envision, surface designers, when you're using humans in physical spaces, I, I like to call them kind of playsonas, right? Um, and you can... Uh, interact with, okay, what if a person comes in here, well, we need a sign here that tells them where to go, and then, or maybe we need steps that go up and down. And so for, for them, they, they, they experimented with different um, layouts of a CVS. What, what do you see when you first walk in? And they eventually settled on this model where uh, the, the pharmacist was in the round, like a theater in the round, and they st stood in the middle of the store with their stuff. And so no matter where you were in the store, you could come to that central fo focus point and engage with the pharmacist to fill your subscription. So there are a ton of different tools. Uh, in fact, I have a book um, in the car, 250 Service Design Tools and Methodologies. It's, it's, there's just a blue million. And almost all of them can be leveraged in UX design, 
UI design. Uh, there, it's just fantastic. There's a plethora of tools available to you. So uh, what does this have to do with you? Is it marketing's job, right? Is it, don't UX designers kind of already do a lot of this? Um, why does it feel so familiar to you? Because it should. So uh, a friend once told me his daughter was interested in being a UX designer and was asking what things she needed to study, learn, or know to get into the industry. So I said, well, let me think about that for a second. Uh, you need to know IA, user research, some visual interaction design, editing and curating, some copywriting, process management's good, and information design. He's like, he's jotting these down. I'm like, oh, oh, wait. Um, there's also uh, agile methods, analytics, use cases, tech, domain knowledge, right? You can't design tax software unless you understand at least a little bit of tax. You know, uh, business knowledge, social networks. He's like, oh, wow, that's, that's a lot. I mean, oh, yeah, sorry, one more thing. Sketching, presenting, facilitating, critiquing, storytelling. You need to be up in front of uh, CEOs, tell them why their product sucks, and, but it's okay, I'll fix it all for you. Uh, yeah, just, just study these things, and you can be a UX designer. So that's okay. And I stole this from Jared Spool, by the way, so this isn't, this isn't you know, unique. It's, it's just this notion of... There's a lot to what we do. And that's why we come from super diverse backgrounds. Some of us were developers, some of us were musicians, some of us were uh, accountants, right? It, 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 there's any number of ways you get to UX. And it's because you find yourself gravitating towards, oh, I like this, I like this, I like this, and then I like understanding how humans interact with things and people and other people and other things, and all of a sudden you're a UX designer. So, so what? So for me, you're gonna hear my definition of, of, of kind of how service design fits in, and you may differ a little bit, and that's okay. We're all, we're all growing. So you'll have a UX designer who's in charge of the website, and then you've got somebody who's in charge of SEO, support, sales, reception, catering, marketing, kind of all those things that I talked about with Nest. There was somebody in charge of support, somebody in charge of designing the, the packaging, and someone in charge of designing the, the instruction manual, and the website, and the SEO, and then the, the, the markup. And so there were these silos of different people running the UX thing that they, were, that they owned. And this is where the Totoro metaphor came in. And if you've never seen the movie, it won't make any sense. But to me, this is service design. Totoro has an umbrella that pays, plays a big role in the movie. Ta-da! There's the metaphor. <laughs> so, um, because as I said, everything is UX, right? This, this umbrella of service design helps tie all those services together. Um, I went to a, an adaptive path journey mapping workshop. Uh, Patrick Quattlebaum uh, was the one running the workshop from adaptive path, and, and he shared a story with Redbox. Um, and he said, so imagine with Redbox, there's a mobile app. That's generally not the first thing you see, though. The first thing you see is the kiosk. So there was an industrial designer who owned designing the kiosk. And then there was a UX UI designer team involved with the kiosk software itself. Right? And then there was the graphic designer who was designed with signage, uh, or who was responsible for signage design. And then there were the graphic designers responsible for all the inserts and the little thing that flies off to the side. But then when you go to redbox.com, needed to make sure that that experience felt the same as kind of the kiosk. They needed to be uh, brand related. And then, of course, they came out with the mobile app. And now they have Redbox streaming. So there's all these different silos, if you will, and nobody owns like everything, that's where service design comes and plays a role. It's not that you own design for all of these things, but as a team, each of these silos is coming together and, and saying, this is the vision, this is, this is what my product looks like. And you're like, awesome. And the service designer takes that. And they say, how about you, Jim, and your team? And he pulls that stuff in. And he's able to coordinate, facilitate, and, and help balance the brand that cuts across those swaths, such that as uh, if you're a product company like Redbox, kind of a thing, or technically I would maybe call them a service even, um, that's how a service design might make sure that everything is, is put together. But you don't have to have products to be a service designer involved in it. So for another example is uh, designing the experience of a doctor telling a patient they have cancer. So how would, you, how would you design that experience? There might be software involved. There might be a website involved. I don't know, right? It depends. Um, so you start with 
research. You start, excuse me, to try to understand what are people going through. Um, what is it, how do people first contact? Does a doctor call and leave a message? You've got cancer, right? Is that, is that what they do? No, right? Do they leave a message? If they do, what do they say during that message? What should their tone of voice be? If they answer the phone, is the message different than if it was a voicemail? And then when they come in, how big is the room where you make them wait to see the doctor? What color is it? What's on the walls? What kind of material is there for them to look at and to hold and touch? What, what kind of music is playing? What does it smell like? Right? Can you, can you design an experience that is as optimal as possible to tell someone they're going to die? And then when they come in the room, how do you begin the conversation? What do you say? How, how much do you say? How little do you say? And when you tell them, you've got cancer, here's the basics. And then you step back. Now they're engaged, right? Now what do they want? Well, I, I think in some of the experiences, maybe they want every little bit of knowledge. They, didn't, they knew a little bit about a cancer before, and now they need to know everything about cancer because they need to know how they're going to fight and, and beat this son of a gun. So, so they... What do we do? Do we give them pamphlets? Do we give them handouts? Do we have an iPad prepped with every little bit of knowledge about cancer that they would ever want and just say, I'm sorry, you have cancer, here you go. I'm gonna sit back, let me know when you have questions or if you just need to go, go, right? Is there, an, is there another room where they can go and cry and be with their loved ones as they come to terms with this? Do they do it alone? Do you leave the room, right? All of this can be designed to make this the best possible experience. And that's just a horrible example. Disneyland is, is the good example, right? Disneyland is the pinnacle of service design. And not because of their long lines, but everything is designed. The way the, the, the trash pick up and where things are, how the park's laid out, the bracelets, everything. And I think it's as optimal as, as possible. So this is what service designing looks like. You've seen it before, because that's what we do. So are you ready? to go down the rabbit hole.